everybody, my name is Tris and this is Double O'Neill. This channel is about model railways and kind of my vlog based journey on things. So every week, every two weeks, I will give you kind of an update on what I've been up to. And I've had a good past couple of weeks. It's been two weeks since my last kind of episode that I've released. And in each episode, I try and share either part of my journey of getting a new loco, um, rolling stock, 3D printing an object for the railway, could be a building, could be something small, some painting. That's always good fun. I enjoy a bit of painting. It, you know, it's something that you can sit back and relax and enjoy. And we're going to cover that a bit on the video. We're going to cover 3D printing, two types of printing I want to talk about. I want to talk about a new loco that's come, as well as some new rolling stock. I want to also mention I had a lot of fun on my last stream, which was building a Metcalf Great Western Railway signal box. And I will be very honest, I was impressed with the house that I built before. You'll see that on the stream before. And after that, I thought I'll get myself this wonderful looking kit. And I truly was uh, impressed when building it. You think, oh, a card model, like how, how good could it actually be? But when you go through the process of simply following the instructions, assembling the sides, sticking the various bits together, and you get choices along the way with this kit, you can either have stone, like it is here, or you can go to brick. I chose stone. I uh, was chatting to, let's say, the community that was on at the time when I said, brick or stone, everybody and everyone started putting their votes in and we picked it as we were going and we built it up and it looks very very nice i'm looking forward to putting it up on the layout to show you how it is so there'll be some shots coming in now obviously it'd be looking very nice um sitting near the station because i have in my head an idea of where we start um to get towards the bridge with the steel supports and the, the brickwork that's underneath it um, we'll have this just before it just like at um, Nen Valley Railway which on my last episode we covered and we could see a bit more of that so that will be sitting there I don't know if this will be a temporary thing until I decide to make one or paint it or whatever um, but this is lovely just the way that it is so I recommend trying out some of their kits um, I've ordered another one recently um, I won't disclose what it is it will be on my next stream probably because it's nice to chat to everyone on the live streams um, it's nice to find out what you're up to and interact so check it out sometime when I'm next on I have no real plans of when I'm gonna be on but it's one of those things that I enjoy doing and it's able um, it enables me to talk to you so yeah wonderful wonderful little um, station not station signal box The next thing that I wanted to talk about was the bridge. The bridge was uh, from In the Greenwood Laser and it is made from wood and it's laser cut as in the description and so again ages ago now it was on a live stream I put it together had a lot of fun with that and it's been placed up on the layout. So with the embankment, it goes across, I want to have a little road coming through it, or a little river, I don't know. I haven't really worked out what I want to do exactly. I just want to have some fun. That's the process. That's what it's all about. I'm assuming you're all feeling the same kind of thing. You want to just enjoy yourself. It's a hobby at the end of the day. So with that, I needed to paint it. One thing that I don't have confidence on it is painting with um, 
acrylic paints onto wooden surfaces and what I've found even when I feel like I've sealed it enough with primer the paint kind of sucks into it and that kind of never gives me that desired effect compared to when you do it on plastic you can kind of dry brush things afterwards just like on the wood but when you want to put the mortar in and, and create all that nice look with the laser cut bits um, cut always a little bit deeper and the paint kind of you know, zaps into it and sometimes stains the top of the brick and had some trouble with it so with this um, I had a lot of fun I thought how about I lacquer it or varnish it whichever way you want to look at it and from there it was a case where that surface is more sealed than it's ever been sealed I then primed it afterwards the paint still stuck on which is great and I had acquired some paints when well, I brought them and they're from Omen Miniatures let's grab the box so this is Omen Miniatures um, they I don't know much about them but they do this little pack and this is 44 pounds for 20 sets and they're quite large paint tubs so the good size here so how much is in here does it tell me 18 millilitres so that's actually I find good value considering some of the other pots are smaller and of same values um, so yeah really really pleased with these and the reason I went for it is because they have a number of colours aimed at brickwork so we have mortar which is kind of I think we're going to use that for the mortar and then there's a brick base colour um, carmine red uh, vermilion red and they're two highlights that one there as well as some other ones which has got like a red brown and that and I use them to do all the different bricks and everything so what I want to do is we're gonna flick on to painting it um, we'll have a little look at utilizing these paints to paint up what ends to be something that I'm actually quite proud of because I haven't had a lot of confidence with bricks it's still not as good as a lot of the brickwork I've seen I've looked at some of the work that my brother's done and he's fantastic with bricks and he told me that he enjoys painting bricks and I just thought well I don't at the moment but maybe that would change and maybe it's because I'm trying to paint the, the wooden construction based bricks but anyway let's go and take a look at that and we can enjoy a few shots of that being painted and then we'll come back and have a look at some of the other great stuff that's been going on so this is the bridge we've got the kind of the steel section in the middle and the brick each side I've lacquered it first to seal up the wood and then I've primed it um, that's trying to seal the let's call it the crevices where the mortar would be or the mortar course using the brick base which is kind of a ready brownie color I'm kind of really happy with how this color looks um, I'm gonna just directly paint all over this thing and with the essence of yeah maybe we just get it on the tops or whatever but I started out gently with it but then I realized that I just need to just lay the paint on get it on there if it goes in the cracks great you know just keep sealing up those um, crevices because um, after this I'm only going to varnish this anyway the Omen Miniatures paint comes out quite thick which is great for what I'm doing here I think if you're painting a normal model or a miniature um, or even in the plastic stuff you'd probably water it down a little bit and it does say that but now that's all coated I'm just using some of my matte varnish by um, Vallejo and I've used this a lot on wagons various things and I'm using this quite thickly so then it drops inside those deep crevices because I think that's some of the issue that, that the paint goes in there and it stays but it disappears inside so I can do this if I want to do this again maybe I just use an airbrush I've got one um, and I plan to use it. I actually moved it up into this hobby room um, I'm gonna start <laughs> venturing into it so that I could have had a go at lacquering it again you know um, to see if that would have done the job as you can see I've got the mortar by um, Omen Miniatures and I'm gonna figure out what I'm doing so obviously I'm not an expert at painting um, some of you will be shouting at the screen some of you will be saying mortar at first I've had some advice on that and then dry brush later I had a little go with that I didn't get the results I got wanted sorry the the brick base came out too bright um, with that being a baseline on it I didn't really like it so I kind of went in thick on this and I've dabbed it off and stuff like that and still wasn't quite happy with it because actually just kind of I don't know just, you can see bits are getting stuck in the gaps which is great um, but I want an easier process than this because I'm gonna get through a lot of kitchen roll 
So as I went on, I introduced more and more water until it dropped into the gap. So I'm still not achieving it here. Um, but it's all part of learning. You know, we're not doing this half the time because we're, e we're an expert because we want to have a go at doing it. So you can see here, it's a bit more runny here. And I can see it dropping straight into the gaps and it goes here. It does dry and lose a little bit of color, but as you can see here, it's achieving the right effect. The bricks are staying independent and the mortar course, if that's what it's called, um, is being filled up. So I'm thinking, right, I'm getting this right. It's taking a bit of time so far to get here, but finally getting that kind of satisfied feeling and going over some of the old bits. Now with the brush, I'm kind of stippling some paint on and kind of giving it kind of like a dry brush to pick up those top details again. Um, this is just to re-highlight the original work that we'd done because in some places it was a bit too deep in some places it was fine after that I'm using the red brown um, which is another one in the omen paint range which is a little bit darker and just picking out little areas um, and just not in any form of being uniform with it I'm just splodging it on in different little places trying not to go into the mortar course that's why I'm stippling on this is an old brush with the end cut down um, which always works out quite nicely as a stippling brush and that kind of through having the brick base color the way that the mortar course has discolored some of the other bits adding this and then the highlights I'm going to be adding should come out hopefully all right I look at the houses over the road from my house um, and try and look at how those bricks work and yeah you just got to keep going do bit by bit until it starts well looking all right and you, you never know what's going to look until it's all done really and you can always come back and do some weathering i see a lot of brickwork looking very dark this is the um one of the highlights which is the i think it's called carmine and that um it's just more of a like a purpley red um, as you do see in bricks a little bit actually when you start looking at the walls it looks quite dominant here but once it was all painted I was kind of happy with it um, I'm going to keep learning this was a much brighter one this is the vermilion colour and I wasn't sure when I was putting it on I thought this is quite bright and I thought maybe I should mix it with some of like the brick base colour but adding little bits here and there and looking at it afterwards actually the brightness of how it looks here I'm going to do put too much on a touch of my finger to kind of squidge it out a little bit. But I just had little details in here and there. And like I said, I'm no expert at this. As you've seen by some of my other brickwork that I've done, it always ends up looking too purpley. So finally, something actually looks more like a red brick, which is nice. After that, I use the mortar to represent what would be like the concrete section, um, which I guess has the steel reinforcement inside it. Um, which be on these side bits and I run it down the lengths. You're not really going to see much of this. Um, I think you're only going to see one side of what is the eight sides. Eight sides? Four sides, what am I about? Um, and you, yeah, you'll probably then see that it gets hidden by either a tree or I weather it or whatever. I don't want to weather now because I don't think there's any point. Um, I want it to match everything else that's going on. So. I want to do all that stuff at the end and also I don't have a lot of confidence in regards to learning weathering. With these I did like two or three coats because I like using acrylics and you can go in quite lightly with the colours um, and if you feel that you've gone quite thick I've just dipped my brush in the water and I just go back over again. Um, it's a case of uh, just you can you can add water basically water gets rid of it and if you hate what you've done add a load of water with some tissue and you can mop off most of it it won't look perfect but you can always start again and the key part is being kind of neat and tidy about it i'm gonna try my best anyway i'm um, really pleased with this anyway so i had to move on to the steel bridge and i used the tarmac gray and the dirty black and i mixed them together to get what is a darker um gray i've matte black painted this i primed it with some gray and then I use some matte black spray, just some Alfred's jobby stuff. Um, pop that on, and then after I'm kind of giving it a rough kind of paint up, really. Nothing that's too <laughs> much to a plan, but I wanted to leave the corners dark um, and put some um, 
uh, you know high levels of grey and this looks bright here but it, it when the acrylics do dry they go more and more to the original colour that's behind it you know more and more layers and get the colour you want which is kind of nice you can't make too many mistakes so after that um, I've added like bits in the centre I start kind of dry brushing these areas with the much lighter greys um, and just to give it kind of a nicer look again I'm not an expert at this but I'm having a go um, so you can see just a bit of dabbing on there a bit of dry brushing and just picking out those little highlighted areas um, so hopefully it looks nice once it's together but we'll see it we'll put it on the layout and yeah I'm sure we'll come back to it another day <laughs> Okay, so here it is. This is the wonderful bridge. And that is gonna be going up on the layout. And it's gonna be supporting the track because it <laughs> rocks on over. And I'll decide what's going underneath it. Is it gonna be cars? Is it gonna be a very small stream rivery thing? I don't know. Um, we can make it up as we go along. It's past the fun of this uh, wonderful hobby. And yeah, so that's that. So we'll go away from painting for a minute because we're going to come back to some really fun stuff. Well, for me, it was fun. For you, you'll have to judge once you watch it. I got myself something that I've been after for a little while. I absolutely love Stepney from the Thomas character series. And I'd seen that there was a Stepney um, A1 Terrier. And I can't find any anywhere. And I just thought that would be great to, to have one of them going around. And it's such a pretty colour scheme. So I had a little look online and I found one, I looked at Hattons, they had one of the Hornby ones, um, it was the Merton from the Centenary um, the kind of batch that they did last year. Um, and this is number I think 508 um, and it's a really gorgeous, really gorgeous loco. Um, opening it up, you know, you get the normal boxes that you get where, you know, that same size as the loco kind of general shape that you get. This one was actually in a really large box and had a fold out lid. I was actually kind of, I was impressed. I didn't really think about that part, but I just thought, well, it's just gonna be there 100 years one. It was a bit more expensive, but I thought it's a, let's say a collectible piece. And I thought I'll get it and, and see what it's like. And yeah, upon opening it, really, really nice. There was only one, not an issue I'd say, cause I can fix this, but the front coupling was broken off inside. But that's nothing, I can swap that out with some bits and it'll be fine and to be honest, I never like to run the front couplings because, well, 
I'm normally pulling something from behind and if I want things to kind of have that scale look I like to leave that front one off just to give it that more authentic kind of beautiful nature of all of it so that was that anyway so looking over it the painting's really really nice because you've got the the green shade um, that's on like the water tank and then you've got a red a black and a white set of lines that um, are you know surrounding then the I think it's still called a green but it's kind of an orangey yellowy browny kind of mix color uh, but they say improved green I think on the side of the packaging um, you're welcome to chime in and let me know what you think of what the colors are meant to be called um, but no it's just really really lovely um, painting um, with the builders plate on the side of it just really fine fine writing that's it's so impressive how small things can go uh, when you look at all of it the wheels again they're really really pretty um, and then they've got the same colour as the loco with then some green insert bits for like the weights and everything and the chassis the side of it it's it's all red it's it's truly a just really pretty loco inside like the firebox detail and everything that's just it's just nice um, I'm just impressed with it the coal's shiny you know um, and as we work our way through everything and the details of all like the, the braking mechanisms it's so fine like when I was picking it up I felt well I, know, I might break this I'll be really careful where I put my fingers um, the buffers they don't compress but I don't often run them round and waiting for them to compress against anything else um, but yeah just a really nice lovely loco and uh, yeah really pleased with it and I've wanted one for a while so to go with that you know we're going to run it on the layout in a minute and we're going to see some clips of it going round I thought I'd get myself some LB and SCR coaches and these are the that generic type one that uh, Hornby have done that allow them to run a number of different paint schemes um, and I've got myself a first and a third class one I didn't get the ones with the lights because I thought well how often am I going to put the lights on it might be a case where I do it for a video or maybe later on once I've got other lights on the railway and I can turn it down and I get to see them so maybe it's something I add later on but I just thought and also there's a case of I couldn't get hold of um, more than one or two with lights in um, so I just thought I'll get all the normal ones I thought why not um, but looking at them they're very pretty uh, again um, the way that the roofs are um, they've got that white um, coating on it with the the details on top um, people talk about the oil fittings and gas of various things I don't know too much about these things and I'm not going to pretend to but looking at it they're nice they're really nice you have to clip on the side rails the footing bits I guess for um, people who you know not to fall down in between a gap or anything like that I'm not sure what they're for exactly but you see them on all the various things so it's got a little footstep um, but yeah all the writing's nice the lining's nice um, I wouldn't be able to do it myself that's why I always think it looks good but there's been lots of people doing videos about these so I felt that I don't need to do a video about all the details on them but you'll see some nice shots of them and what I wanted to do was have my terrier pulling some coaches that would be for you know it um, because normally I have great western ones or Th southern railway or even some intercity and I thought you can't be putting them for this video so I treated myself I'm going to get some more as well in great western colours to, to go behind um, some of my great western engines so but that'll be for a future video so let's go and take a look and just watch it going around for a few minutes um, and yeah we'll come back and we'll talk about the next thing
hope you enjoyed that. I loved it when I watched it going around and I have my other Southern branded one which is a very old one that my father gave me. Not the best runner, it's a bit of a noisy one actually when it's going around but it's nice, it's really nice and it looks good. So now I have two, maybe I'll get one of the Great Western branded ones. I'd like to get some DCC sound eventually in one of them but it's not super important for me right now. It's just nice to have them and just the looks of them, it's just wonderful. So I'll be spending a bit of time gawping at them. The next step I wanted to talk about 3D printing. I've had quite a few questions about 3D printing and I thought what we'll do is we'll go through the stage of drawing up the item that we're going to do and then we'll go from there. And I'll talk about the positives and negatives, but mainly the positives of doing all this. Um, so I wanted to show you just this little workman's hut. Okay, um, it's a nice simple thing. I thought we'll show you how to draw it. I use a program called Creo3, it's what I use for work, so I'll just carry on um, and use that kind of software. But there are other softwares out there. You've got Fusion 360, which is something you can download. There's an element of it that's free that allows you to do drawing, as well as you've got Tinkercad um, and various other CAD programs. They're all out there that will take care of you um, in regards to that ease of getting into it. And there's also quite a lot of YouTube um, content out there that can help you learn how to do these things so um, whatever your age this is all accessible to you and it might seem a bit daunting at the beginning but you know having a little go drawing a square box then putting a hole in it maybe even radiusing some edges afterwards putting a hole in another place suddenly you've got an object that you're after so what we do is we'll jump onto the computer and I'm going to show you all of it coming together, just drawing it quick. Now, I'm not going to teach you how to draw, but I'm going to show you the process I go through drawing it and then getting onto 3D printers, which there are two types that I utilize. I've got a resin based one, which uses UV light to cure the resin um, at certain heights. As it goes up, it creates the shape. And then you've got um, an FDM um, printer, which is fused deposition modeling, which squirts out hot plastic out of a tiny nozzle. And that creates your shape as it goes up and it cools down and you get to the top of that shape and that's done. One is good for high detail. So the resin printer, which is an SLA um, printer, you drop files into the both of the softwares, which are the same as each other, basically STL files, which is stereolography or something like that I'll put the word up properly and anyway that goes into these um, softwares that we use to create these files and we have great fun and create these bits so let's jump over see me do some modeling with it we'll put it onto those bits of software we'll then hit print and then what we'll even do is paint them up but what we'll also talk about is the fact that we can print up N-Gage as well and even O-Gage which I'll show you in an inserted picture because I haven't finished painting it so I was going to add it in afterwards, but look at these two, same thing, one's bigger than the other, but that's engaged, you can see how small it is, it fits on the end of my finger, but this is a workman's hut, so that's the wonderful thing about this, so if you get hold of a file for double engage, you can shrink it down, it will mean that wool thicknesses get very, very thin, but if you can get on CAD, you can always do a bit of work and thicken some things up, but anyway, let's go take a look. I've got the file here that I drew up, it's got four sides, and it's got a roof, so the five. I want to be able to print this in two manners, so in each flat side on the FDM printer or as one, as an assembled file um, and that will be on the resin printer. So I need to start with something, so I'll start with the front so I can work out proportions, it's the tallest side so we can have a door on there and some windows. So I pick a plane and I make a rectangle, but before I do that I always put a little centre line, makes it easier to draw certain things. Anyway. I put my rectangle out there and I start applying sizes to it. How big do I want it to be? Well, 26 millish, 24 mil is like the height of a door. Um, so I go for like 30 and I'll make it square. So this will be 30 as well. With that done, I just want to give it a certain thickness for the wall. I'll give it about a millimetre because that will print. All right, you probably want to go a little bit bigger than that on resin printers. Um, they you do get quite flexible at certain thicknesses or they can break and split and things like that so um, I actually came back later on and, and thickened this up for when I did some more printing of this 
if I had the doors in now, I've sped this up. You want to add in all your little details, and it's all part of the process. You're adding in lines, cutting bits out, you're making little rectangles and circles, whatever you want. And you're adding in whatever it is you want to make. So what does it look like? Okay, well, let's draw that. Put some sizes in, proportions. I've got nothing specific that I'm using. You know, I haven't got to measure the door, but I know proportionally that's kind of what it needs to look like a little door handle I didn't go to town too much it's going to be small so I radius the ends and there's also somewhere for people's feet to go so that's a little foot place um, you know the, the door step effectively in here um, it's just a case where you work away until it's done um, you click away um, and yeah you just got to be determined you know this is what I want this is what I want to draw and, and there we are I want to draw the corrugations because it's a corrugated steel um, unit so I can have do one part of it and then pattern it along and this is stuff you can do most softwares and you play with it till you're happy and you need to remember your dimensions you did so I did a, a 0.5 radius and then a 0.7 step going across and it gave me, it gave me a, a rough kind of yeah that's what I'm after kind of look and I work my way around and obviously Get a, bit, get a bit dizzy watching this don't you when it's coming back fast but if I did it in the slow speed it's about 50 minutes it took me to draw all four sides in the top but I did come and fettle it later on um, due to printing one looking at little things that I didn't like about it um, and I'm doing some um, engage ones for my mother who likes engage as well as myself so I've thickened them up because the wall thicknesses have gone down to 0.5 and it become very flexible so I've actually increased it all up to kind of one and a half mil, two mil at end gauge size. Um, so here you can see these are like one mil wall thicknesses. A bit undersized in my view for, you know, having a nice structure and for it to hold its shape. But it printed out all right, all the same. You just got to be careful with it. You can't go and sit on it, obviously. Um, not with any model would you do that. So I do my sides and then once I've done one side, all I did was I mirrored that side and created a right hand side. So I only had to draw one side in total so and any changes you do to one side, it will apply it to the other one later. I then do the rear of the building. Again, I put my corrugations in, really simple part. It's basically just a square. And I add the details going across it a number of times. Here we go, there's the pattern. It looks relatively easy, right? It can be daunting though doing all this kind of stuff if you've never done it before. You just want to draw a square building to begin with and maybe you want to use some of the Metcalf um, stick on um, card sheet with the brickwork on or you could stick on afterwards some of the plastic um, sheets that you can buy um, which have got all the you know that texture onto it. So it's up to you this could be your method of getting structures built up quickly and then part of the scratch build is that you add on you know bits later but I like the challenge of drawing bricks or as you see here we've got the corrugated steel building but we need to let some light into it so what I've gone through the route is doing myself some windows because obviously everyone needs to be able to get a bit of light in there I'm sure you didn't have electrics in there back in the day um you know maybe you had a gas candle or something I don't know um but I'm just going to basically draw the structure of the windows we got the the divisions um the one on the left is a slide left and right jobby and the one on the right is permanent so once that's done it's a case of let's pop a roof on it and again just like all the other bits i make my corrugations and i pattern it across here it is and it comes across there we go that's the roof now i'm just going to do some drop down side bits that kind of enclose the top and i guess stop it falling apart or whatever and they also give you something to paint that lovely dark stone colour of the Great Western Railway or whatever railway that you like. Um, so it's very simple. We can see what I'm doing. Each stage of it is you're drawing a rectangle most of the time or you're doing a circle or you're patterning it. And you can do this on nine every software that's out there kind of thing. You've just got to be patient if you want to learn it and, and have a go. You can draw anything you like to the most complicated part, but you just got to learn... Well, what button does that for me? What icon do I need to select on? Do I need to generate anything else at the same time doing it? But once that's done, I was happy with it. I now need to take that um, out of here as an SDL file. And that's a stereolithography file. Didn't say it right before. 
Um, and to do that, I just hit save as, and I changed the saving type from, this is a PRT file, to an STL file. And I'll come up with this export bit here, and on the chord height, I always pop zero, and it gives you a minimum of a 005. It creates all these tiny triangles over every single part. We then bring that into Cura. Um, actually, Cura is what I use for the um, FDM printing. This is Chitu Box, um, which I use for the resin printing. And I come in here and I have that object which I put at kind of a 45 degree-ish angle so then I don't get stepping because you've got little uh, pixels that display where it wants to print the bits. And if you have it, let's say, too flat but at an angle, you'll see these ridges build up. And that isn't good. I want to make my N gauge one here as well so I can scale it and literally because it's 4mm to 2mm going from 00 to N, I just go 50% here. I might be wrong in doing this, but this is what I understand. That's that. After that, you need to add the supports. And what are the supports? The supports are the bits that get it off the build bed and allows you to print anything you like. They're kind of the feeds, effectively. Imagine them as all part of one big injection mold, um, and they allow the plastic to, to stick in that area. Um, it's a supporting network that allows you to print this structure all the way up because it's printed in 0.03 of a millimeter um, you know steps so you can't just print a shape in air because all you do is you get a blob of resin at the bottom of your um, bath that you know the resin is sitting in so we need to somehow connect everything up this one wasn't perfect exactly because I didn't pick up enough of the back of the first edge so you actually lose bits of detail at the beginning and that ends up being um, at the detriment of how good the model looks because you have Kind of loose resin floating around or sticking to what you're doing next um, so the better you do this the better results you're going to get i'm going to add a few of these kind of lighter um, tree supports um, they crack up you don't really notice that they've been on there so i like to use them then use some more medium supports um, right at the top where there's already a lot of structure underneath holding it where i've got the heavy supports um, they're doing most of the work, but this thing will try and rock. It's got to basically unweld itself from the top plates and the bath from underneath. Um, and the bigger the object, the more kind of structural supports that I find you need. Otherwise, the supports can be broken off the bit that you're trying to print at the time. And you can end up having horrible prints um, or prints that just fail on you. And I've had many. Um, so I've learned over time that you really need to take care of it. The exposure time is what's in here, so I'm actually going to change this to seven and a half, um, and that allows it to print a little bit quicker. It's a small part; it's delicate. I get uh, better details. I find with slightly less exposure. The longer it exposes for, the um, kind of the bigger um, bit per pixel that it makes. So if a pixel's um, 50 microns um, by 50 microns, whatever. Um, if you put it on for a moment it will do that size if you put it on for too many moments um, it will actually start doing the periphery around it uh, more and more you know the more it's on you can imagine it's like light burning away um, it's setting it so I find my file and I hit print and basically I have a plate that comes down into this bath of resin which has the UV light shining into an LCD screen um, and that um, puts the image of whatever I want. So it will start out with the base, then the supports, and then it will go through the different parts of the shape as it goes up. Once that's printed, this is about kind of a four or five hour print on this printer. This is not the fastest printer. I have a new one coming. Um, actually, at the time of recording this, it's actually arrived. I haven't got out the box. So I get them out here. Um, a lot of people don't enjoy this process, um, but I don't mind it. Um, as long as you have lots of tissue ready and some isopropyl alcohol, um, I take it off the build plate. I let the build plate drip a little bit to begin with on there. Make sure there's nothing that's going to drip all over the table. I then just literally chisel it off here. It doesn't take much. I haven't marked the bed yet. It's been really good. So I use my plastic spatula. And maybe I've just been lucky with my build bed, um, but it's always come off relatively easy. I give that a good clean, pop it back in the machine, and once they've been in there, I now pop it into the ultrasonic cleaner. And I put that in there for about seven minutes and have it buzzing away. And once that's done, I take it out, I wash it under the cold tap just to get rid of all the isopropyl that's on there, and then I let it dry completely. Once that's dry, I snip off all of these supports 
and basically you just be careful because you could damage your model and I did on this one I actually damaged a bit of the window um, so you need to take your time a little bit and as you can see here I've lost a piece there and I'll glue a little piece in to try and represent the window um, but fine um, anyway I'll drop them into what is my makeshift resin bath it's kind of a shiny inside um, with loads of UV um, LEDs and I flick that on and I only put it in there for about four to five minutes it depends I'll have a little feel of it see if it's hardened but I try not to overexpose it because I find it gets brittle um, so that's it really now that's done I started out using enamel paints on this and when I did my O gauge one I used um, acrylic paints but basically um, the enamel paints that they're all right but they take ages to dry and I've got things to be getting on with and I want to paint the thing um, and so I don't know if it's because my paints are a little bit old um, they yeah they just took too long they always felt like they're still slightly sticky um, I gave it a good stir like a really good stir um, but they didn't help it so I finished these using the enamels um, painting all the sides um, with the light stone as well as the roof as well as the inserts or insets on the door um, and I did I think I did two or three coats again on this. Um, this is my dark stone that we're going to use now. And with the small brush, being very careful, uh, painting the door detail, um, which is the, the ray section, as well as working on the, um, you know, the top edge piece that works its way round. Um, the tricky bit was actually painting this end gauge one. Just trying to work out ways of holding, and in the end, my little finger became my my favourite position. Um, and it's just one of those <laughs> things you just gotta work around ways of doing things and maybe I need to make some bases to stick them to. Using some Humbrol uh, Matte 34 it is, but you know they're enamel paint, I did the windows, um, they came out quite nicely, did a couple of coats again of that. If I did this again I'd primer it in white and that's what I did for the O gauge one and this is why I'm printing the O gauge one, this is my Ender 3 V2, you've seen it a number of times on the videos, a number of times on the videos and I thought Instead of showing you everything printing, you know how that all works, you've seen plenty of my stuff. Um, if you want to see more of this kind of thing, just let me know if you enjoy all this technology that I like to share with you. But these are the parts. You've got my roof, then there is a side, a back, a front, and another side. I'm just going to use some Yoohoo and stick them together. Really simple, just squirt them in. I wasn't really too worried. I just kind of popped it in. And then you just hold it together. There's a bit of string that always hangs off on them. But once that was dry, I primed it. I used acrylics this time from Rail Match. Much prefer them. I do three coats. I don't know if the finish was as good on the acrylics. Maybe I need to shake them for a bit longer um, and do a bit more stirring. Uh, but it was simple. The windows were already white, but I actually come back in with some primer whites by Rail Match, which I kind of felt was quite a nice white to go on. But bigger scale much nicer to paint easier to get these areas afterwards I really gave the brush a good good clean the problem I find with paint is it works its way up to the let's say the stalky bit the bit that's right up uh, by the metal ferrule that holds it so I try and make sure that's good but as you can see all the sizes fitting inside of each other like a Russian doll it's uh wonderful little project to do and it's nice to share with you because it's really honestly fun and I think they look great. Can you see the advantages of all this then? You can have um, the 3D printer to create what you want and you can create lots of them you can paint them afterwards using CAD will allow you to model what you want to create and it is daunting I know it's sometimes made to look very easy when someone else is doing it that has a little bit of experience on it but even if it's a case of going on to something like Thingiverse and looking up various things typing in model railways model trains you can get bits from there and print it for your layout and have a lot of fun. Also, there's other people that have done some CAD work and they've put the models up there and you can pay for something that someone's already drawn and then you can go and print it on your own printer. 
um, or there's the next step of going through Shapeways and they offer that service of printing things um, that, you know, and sending it to you. And there's lots of printing services out there. So it's a case of, you know, if you want something kind of special, specific to your requirements, it can be done. Um, I'm not someone that's kind of delved into scratch building yet. I do various bits and bobs, but I enjoy modeling on the computer. And if I do need to scratch build, I will do well, kind of get my fingers dirty, I'll be drilling holes, cutting things, filing, gluing bits together. But I hope this has helped in some way for you getting some confidence to do some modeling of some way um, in the way of 3D printing. Um, the printers aren't massively expensive. If you did want to get into it and you were going to use it, you know, divide it up by the amount of prints you do, it's really worth it. Um, some people might think, oh, this is expensive getting into this, buying a 3D printer just to print that. So, well, no, I'm going to print hundreds of things, maybe even thousands, give me enough time. Um, and it really becomes a really useful, fun tool that you can use. You can watch it create in that moment as it's growing up. And that's one thing that I love about it. And I like being creative, uh, coming up with ideas, you know, then you draw it, you put it on that software, we then print it, and then I can paint it. And then we put it on the railway, all part of the big grand plan. Anyway, I'll stop talking about 3D printing and I'm gonna leave you to it. I'd like to say a big thank you, as always, to people that have been subscribing to the channel. I enjoy connecting with you through your comments, through the live streams. I even put a poll up recently to find out what era you like, and it seemed to be popular that it was up to the 1940s was the most popular um, and then there was the period up to 67 that people were clicking on the most and people were kind enough to even write on the comments afterwards of what they liked about those eras and so yeah I might do a few more polls for you to kind of give me a bit more information about what you like. I like kind of everything. I'm that guy that's annoying that can't give you a straight answer. But I love the Great Western Railway. That's one of my things that I love. But I like the also the blue and yellow ended um, BR engine logos. Um, I'm not really into the modern day stuff. It's interesting enough as it goes past, but I'm more into those two periods to be open and honest about it. But when there's a good looking loco like this Terrier coming up for sale, I oh, gotta get it. Anyway, big thanks to my patrons. You've decided to support the channel, which is really wonderful. And I must say thank you as always on that one. If you wish to become a patron, look in the see more tab below and you can do that. If not, hit the like, maybe even subscribe to the channel. If you aren't already a subscriber, it means a lot and it helps the channel more and more. Um, and yeah, I'd like to grow the channel and enjoy meeting more and more of you and hearing what you have to say um, about what I'm doing. And I wanna hear about what you're doing as well. Okay, well, see you soon. Take care. Look after yourselves. Bye.